Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 21st, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our take on the ADN's outlook for the coming Alaska legislative session. Second, former Governor Murkowski's proposal for state bids on ANWR leases is a bad idea for the state. We explain why. And third, as we approach the end of the year, our view of the biggest issue that is facing us in 2021. And now, let's join Michael. Let's take a look at uh, our weekly top three. We'll start off with James Brooks's article yesterday, which I touched on briefly, but we really didn't get too deep into, which is, uh, you know, the short term and long term problems, the permanent fund, the issue with uh, Governor Mike Dunleavy's plan, which, of course, ironically, wow, James Brooks sounds like he's against it, even though he, I, you know, the balancing act is just it's not working for me. But uh, give us your thoughts on what it misses and what's concerning and uh, what they got right on it. Well, I think uh, anybody who's interested in the legislature and what's uh, what we're facing in 2021 in the 2021 session needs to take a look at this article. It's a, it sets a good baseline uh, of, uh, of, of issues that are out there, divides it into the long term and, and into short term issues, long term being what the heck we're going to do about this two billion dollar plus deficit we're facing over the next uh, annually over the next decade short term uh, being how do we uh, how's the legislature going to approach uh, uh, the next fiscal year uh, coming up um, uh, in this session and I and I think it's a I think it's a great baseline there's there's a few things that uh, uh, that I uh, sort of um, didn't like uh, as as I worked through the article uh, one is I think it I think it's missing a big piece uh, on the short term. Now the short term is is the governor's proposal uh, uh, to do a supplemental this fiscal year of an additional draw from the earnings reserve to be uh, distributed in the form of, uh, of additional PFD checks, uh, and to some degree uh, the governor's proposal for next fiscal year to again, do a, a, a supplemental draw or a big draw out of the earnings, an excess draw out of the earnings reserve uh, to distribute uh, PFD checks. There, there, There's one thing that needs to be taken into account as you consider uh, that, that proposal, those, those big supplemental proposals um, that, that the article doesn't touch on, and that is the effect of what the federal legislation is going to do uh, in terms of bringing additional uh, money. Uh, into Alaska. One of the things that we've not talked about a lot uh, this last year uh, is how much money has come into Alaska from uh, the COVID relief bills that have been passed by Congress uh, before this before this latest one. Uh, and it's a it's it's a fairly large sum. It's about six point three billion dollars, according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, about six point three billion dollars of federal money, additional federal money, has come into Alaska as a result of the COVID relief bills. To put that in context, that context that's about twelve percent of the state's uh, of the gross uh, state product, which is the state version of the gross domestic product GDP. Um, and, and so we've had about $6 billion come in this last year, that's $6 billion of additional uh, help uh, to the state uh, that's come in uh, uh, from the feds. Uh, there, this 
COVID relief bill is going to bring in some additional money into the state. And when you're looking at next year's budget and the, and the governor's proposals for these for these supplementals, you need to take into account, in my opinion, right. you need to take into account what's coming in from the feds uh, and 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 sort of offset that against uh, against the governor's proposal. What what the governor's proposing to do is is make an excess draw from the ERA, um, which essentially comes at the expense of future generations. Uh, in order to put more money into the Alaska economy. And if the feds are going to put some of that money in uh, that that the state needs in order to maintain economic activity, if the feds are going to contribute some of that, that's less money that we need to draw from future generations um, uh, out of our out of our ERA. That's more money that we can keep in uh, uh, in our permanent fund. So, the the article James's article completely misses that, uh, and I think that's a that's an important consideration. The second thing uh, about James's article that was a surprise to me uh, was the focus on uh, by uh, by Senator von Imhoff and others on on the long on their long term vision. And James describes that this is the first time I'd heard it actually. James describes that as as getting to a hundred billion dollars. Uh, in the permanent fund that would then, at the 5% draw, uh, uh, spin off $5 billion a year. Um, and and that sort of being the long-term fiscal plan uh, that uh, that uh, uh, some in the legislature uh, have in mind. Can I, can I sidebar for just a second? Because the first sure. time I read this, I'm like, well, this is the first. I mean, I've been following this issue for a long time. And that's the first I've ever heard any lawmaker say anything about, well, the goal is to get it to $100 million. But, you know, this has been in their minds for a long time is what's intimated here in the article. And I'm just like, what? I I mean, it sounds like a good idea, but this is the first time we have ever verbalized any of this. Yeah, exactly. And and it, and and this is I mean, this is one of the problems of, of the legislature, right? The legislature gets in their little bubble and they sort of come up with these ideas on their on their own and they and they don't get outside the legislature. Uh, one of the things that the new legislative finance director, Alexi Painter, has talked about is being more open, being more transparent, being have, having more openness by the by the legislature about financial matters so that Alaskans can follow along. Uh, and this goes in the opposite direction. But but just taking that at face value, that hundred billion at face value, basically what that is is the elimination of the PFD. I mean, if the ultimate goal is to live by by the the permanent draws off the permanent fund, five percent draws off the permanent fund, producing about five billion dollars a year, that's that's really when you do uh, inflation adjustment and you do the growth in things like. Um, uh, PERS and TERS and other things that are going to grow without regard to inflation just sort of continue uh, piling up, that $5 billion is going to be the size of government, and that's going to leave virtually nothing uh, for the PFD. So basically what Senator Von Imhoff is saying, and those who are talking about the $100 billion goal are saying, are assuming is they're going to eliminate uh, they're going to eliminate the PFD. The goal is to eliminate the PFD. And and I that, I find that as we've discussed on the program uh, a lot of times, I find that hugely troubling. What you're essentially doing is saying we're going to tax middle and lower income Alaska families in order to fund government. Uh, the top 20 percent uh, uh, pays a trivial amount. Non-residents never pay anything. Uh, and that's uh, we're just going to finance government on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. And I and I, you know, I, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, the concerns about that. So, I, it, it was it was a revelation, uh, as 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 we're both now saying about this hundred billion dollars. But it but it cl- those who talk about it, to 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 for those who hear anybody talking about that hundred billion dollar goal, that's basically the elimination of the PFD. Basically, right. they're going right. to finance government. Well, <clears throat> uh, by eliminating the PFD. And I got to say that which, as you go into it and and, and Natasha's uh, comment in here was talking about taking 10 percent of the fund in one fell swoop and results in a loss of the permanent fund overall, the value of the fund. And it's an extreme whack. And I think it will affect the future. Again, it appears to her mind this is all in isolation to what's going on with the economic catastrophe that's happening here in the state on top of it. I mean, she's not even taking into, a, you know, it's like she's not even 
pretending to understand the effect that many people, uh, many Alaskans, are being affected by this. In fact, they said that that uh, one in five homes right now are behind in the state of Alaska are behind in rent. Uh, one in ten don't have enough, or excuse me, two in ten don't have enough food. I mean, there's I mean, there's a catastrophe going on, and it's like that's all occurring in a bubble outside of where she believed things need to happen. I mean, this is an unusual year. This would not be a normal ask in a regular year. Well, and and it's just, yes, and but but that but you know setting aside the short term, that if, if that's her long term goal, uh, and those who talk who are evidently talking about the hundred billion, if that's their if that's their long term goal, uh, they're visualizing in Alaska uh, without a PFD, and that's that's another frankly complaint I have about James's article. He doesn't talk in the article about who pays. He's not he's not there's not a, there's not a segment of the of the piece that focuses on the implications of of these of these proposals uh, to who pays. It's it's not, for example, on the short term when they when they talk about the excess ERA draw, he's not talking about the. There's not a lot of discussion about the impact on future generations when they're when he's when they're talking about the hundred billion dollars. There's not a lot of a, a, a discussion about the impact on on who's going to bear the burden of that, which is middle and lower income Alaska families. So it's it's a good article uh, for setting a baseline uh, of uh, of of what of what the of what's in the legislature's mind, perhaps, uh, and what's on the legislature's agenda. Uh, but it's missing some pieces, some very important pieces uh, that I think uh, readers, listeners uh, need to be aware of uh, as they as they absorb that article uh, and uh, and sort of understand you know what it is the legislature is is going to be dealing with. From the short term, it's it's you know you need to take into account the federal dollars that are on the way, the the impact of the federal dollars, and and they're and they're significant i mean right it was 12 12 percent of gdp last year it'll be a significant number uh, uh this coming year you, you need to take those into account and you also need to take into account uh the impact of, of driving toward this hundred billion dollars brad keithley is our guest alaskans for sustainable budgets so it's a good starting point but always keep the other things in mind that brad just laid out there for us as well natasha don't, don't care a whit about the impact of legislative ask, actions on Alaska. The real sad thing is that she's still in the legislature. We have some dumb voters here. Well, no, I think she's got a bunch of voters who basically see things the way she does. That's what's going on. I mean, she is surrounded by, um, you know, she is surrounded by uh, her constituents. We're all pretty much in the same boat. I mean, very affluent, not really affected by any takings of the PFD and everything else. They probably have felt the pandemic economic consequences, but just not to the effect that many other Alaskans have. Brad, am I am I wrong here on that take? No, I, I think you're right, Michael. I mean, we've got a, we've got a legislature. Uh, let's see, we did figures a couple of years ago. Uh, something like 90% of the legislature were in the top 20%. Yeah. Uh, and we've got a legislature that's largely insulated uh, from the from the economic effects of, uh, of of what's been going on. And and you know they they listen to their they they hear some of it from their constituents, but personally uh, they um, uh, they don't feel much of it. And and to them and because they're in the top 20%, to them the PFD is not a big deal. Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, you know a vacation to Hawaii or it's a uh, uh, it's it's you know more more savings as opposed to paying for uh, fuel oil and and so they just don't they don't have a connection uh, a large bulk of them don't have a connection to you know what it's like really to live in the state what it's like to right. you know, go go day to day in the state. One of the things that uh, Brooks did have in his article was some discussions about the short term needs of Alaskans. And talking about, I mean, there were many economists who, you know, Musin Gutabi and Ed King and others who basically said putting some cash into people's hands right now is probably one of the most effective ways to help fix this financial crunch. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau collected data in the last week of November and the first week of December found that more of a third of Alaskans are having problem paying for their normal household expenses. One in five aren't caught up in rent, and more than one in ten say their household doesn't have enough to eat. I mean, <laughs> those are some pretty staggering numbers when you look at it, and kind of the answer is let them eat cake, I mean, at this point. 
you know, they they are staggering numbers, but that, what that really tells you is is the actions of the of the feds and of the legislature needs to be targeted at those Alaskans in need. We we've got a situation where we're going to be if we do excess PFD draw, if we do excess permanent fund draws to fund this, we're going to be taking it uh, at the expense of future generations, and we need we need to have a balance, not take any more. Uh, than this generation needs because we're doing it at the expense of future generations, and and so we should target that uh, at those in need. Now that now the federal legislation, the reason I keep going back to the federal legislation, the federal legislation does some of that. I mean, the federal legislation extends um, uh, unemployment, uh, the three hundred dollar uh, excess uh, additional uh, unemployment check for those uh, unemployed for a period of time. Uh, it ha does have the six hundred dollar checks. Uh, to those uh, earning uh, $75,000 a year or less, which in Alaska is sort of middle income uh, or less. Um, and so the, 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 the federal legislation is doing some of that targeting. The state may need to do more, but we need to take into account two things. One, we're taking it from future generations, so we need to take as uh, we need to be careful in, in the amount we take. And two, the amount we take needs to be targeted uh, toward those in need. Uh, Natasha doesn't need another check, to be very honest. She doesn't need another PFD check. Those in the top 20% largely don't need uh, another another PFD check. So if we're going to take this money from future Alaskans, we ought to we ought to be targeting it uh, toward those uh, towards those Alaskans in need, and we ought to be taking into account the federal money that's coming in uh, uh, targeting those in need as well. Yep. Brad, we're coming up into the break here. We're about two and a half minutes away. You want to give us a snapshot of the second part of this, which, of course, is the discussion that uh, the state should uh, be bidding on all these ANWR leases, these federal ANWR leases. Boy, talk about things that, you know, we, we just talked about the $100 billion that we didn't know uh, uh, was that, that that the legislature, some of the legislature were considering. Now we find out yesterday that uh, ADA, the Alaska Industrial uh, Development and Export Authority uh, uh, is is thinking about bidding the state bidding uh, using their dollars to bid on on uh, on Anwar leases. Uh, frankly, in anticipation that industry isn't going to bid, uh, and that's I, they're having a special meeting uh, tomorrow. And I just think it's a horrible idea uh, of the state going down this road. We'll talk about that. That's what we're going to talk about in a second. We're in our weekly top three. We're on to number two, talking about the potential, which uh, has been voiced most recently by former Governor Frank Murkowski. Bill Walker also wrote an article on this earlier uh, about how the state should uh, be bidding on some of these ANWR leases, since it looks like nobody else wants in on these federal leases due to a lot of outside pressure and everything else. The uh, the governors had proposed that the state go ahead and do that, and ADIA, on their own, uh, decided apparently that wasn't a bad idea. So they're proposing to bid $20 million on a variety of uh, leases out there. Brad says, this is a horrible idea. Brad? It, it is. I, so I, I've been an advocate in the past of the state co-investing uh, with, with industry. That was one of the principles behind uh, AKLNG, which was the state was co-investing uh, with uh, with the majors in in looking at uh, the the LNG project. Uh, it's one of the bases, frankly, for the old tax credit program before it just, you know, it just sort of spun off into a separate universe. The old tax credit program, when it was originally developed, was to co for the state to co-invest uh, with uh, with industry, industry lead industry identify the projects uh, and the state as as you know as the royalty owner as a as essentially a 12 percent owner in the uh, in 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 the revenue stream or 12 percent beneficiary 12 and a half percent beneficiary in the revenue stream uh, and a beneficiary as a result of production taxes the state looking at co-investment to make uh, to make some of these projects work what ada is talking about here is something way the heck beyond that ada is saying Basically, uh, and this is you know Walker and, and Murkowski, and I sort of dismissed it when it was Walker and Murkowski. They say a lot of things that that you know sometimes are strange, but but now this is Ada, and, and for those interested, James Brooks published an article 
uh, yesterday, uh, late yesterday, uh, that will be in today's paper, the title of which is State-Owned Alaska Corporation to Consider Bidding on Arctic Wildlife Refuge uh, Oil Leases. Uh, this is the state saying, uh, well, it looks like industry is not going to bid on the on the Anwar acreage, so we're thinking about the state bidding on the on the Anwar acreage, the state essentially taking those leases to some degree, uh, in some sense, turning them into state leases, uh, and then uh, and then the state going out and looking for uh, partners uh, to uh, to help develop those leases. I I, I think it's a horrible idea. Uh, Co-investing with industry, where industry, which has the knowledge base, the expertise, the 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 world view of whether projects are economically feasible. Co-investing with industry uh, makes some sense, but for the state, state to strike out on its own uh, and and uh, and and say, well, industry is not going to be interested in these, so we're going to take them. Uh, I just think I think it's a bad idea. And this isn't, you know, some people are going to defend this by saying, well, it's only thirty million dollars. Uh, the minimum bid on this acreage is only going to total up to thirty million dollars. We get half of that back because the state gets fifty percent of. Uh, of of whatever's the the royalties uh, the bid and the royalties are on Anwar, so we're only talking about 15 million dollars. That's this is just the beginning of it. Just having the bare leases isn't going to do any good. You've got to you've got to figure out what's in those bare leases. To do that, you've got to do seismic. Uh, that's costly. Uh, you've got to do other things to 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 make the leases have value. That's what industry does. Uh, and for the state to become the sole leaseholder uh, out there and for the state to start taking on those burdens. I'll tell you one, the, the thing that, that first struck my mind when I was reading this was, well, this is a bailout to the Alaska services industry. Basically what the state wants, since industry is not going to take these leases, um, uh, the state wants to take these leases and then spin off activity for the Alaska services industry to do the seismic, to do the studies, to do the work, to you know get consultants in to prepare the the necessary environmental uh, 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 applications and things like that. Basically, what the state's trying to do is set up a, a, a subsidy to the services industry, and and that may or may not be in the back of, of Ada's mind, but I sure as heck wouldn't put it past them. Uh, that this is that that's what they have in mind. So I I just think I, again I've been an advocate in the past of the state co-investing with industry, following industry's lead, making good decisions about about investing where industries industry thinks there's activity, and and getting a benefit from that, getting you know some interest in that uh, as a result of the co-investment. But for the state to start striking out on its own, I, this is an administration. Keep in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an administration that said that they that they want to give up on the AKLNG project because industry isn't interested in it, and the state shouldn't be the sole funder or the sole the sole uh, party uh, uh, pushing AKLNG. That makes sense for AKLNG, but it also makes sense. The same logic makes sense for going down this road of of, of starting to have state ownership, sole state ownership uh, of the Anwar leases. I I am. <coughs> I, I'm very disappointed to see to see this getting to the point where uh, where Ada is actually considering uh, doing it with state money. There are better uses to be made of 30 million of, of dollars of state funding, state funding. And if this is if this is what Ada thinks they ought to be doing, um, uh, I, I used a hashtag last night uh, in a post about this that that basically said defund Ada. I mean, I I, I don't I don't think Ada is is I think Ada is pursuing a selective interest here to benefit certain selected segments of Alaska. I don't think this is a an Alaska focused uh, activity that Ada is going down. What do you think about the viability of Murkowski's argument, which was if uh, these all these leases go up and nobody bids, then it makes us look like I guess a paper tiger. That if you know we 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 fought so hard to get here and yet nobody bids on it, it really proves that we didn't really need to drill in Anwar, and so we need to put bids up for that reason alone. What what do you say to that? Well, the world's changed. I mean, uh, uh, the the good analysts, Phil Verlager and others, say you know if this would have been done five years ago, 
uh, there would have been a lot of activity around Anwar. There would have been a lot of excitement, a lot of bidding around Anwar. But but the world's changed the last five years. And and given the fact that we're going into a Biden administration, the world's going to change even more uh, uh, going forward. So, um, you know, to, to spend $30 million to sort of, you know, uh, make your ego feel better, that all those battles you fought in the past were the right battles, uh, I think is a pretty foolish uh, reason to... Uh, uh, to be uh, to be spending money uh, again, that thirty million dollars can be spent on on much better things uh, or saved. You know, we can even right. save for for the right. future. Our biggest issue, Brad, number three. What's the biggest issue in Brad Keithley's mind and Alaskans for sustainable budgets heading into the new year? Well, I think I think we and going back to the original James Brooks article the one on the on on looking at the next uh, session and and the and the longer term i think i think we've come to the realization uh that somebody's going to pay uh going forward for uh, uh for state government that we're not going to get down get state government down to a size where we uh pay for it from traditional revenues uh that there is going to be a that that some alaskans Alaskans in some way, let me try it that way, Alaskans in some way are going to have to pay for government. And I think I think the big issue, it's been the big issue for me for the last year, uh, last couple of years, I think it's going to be an even bigger issue going forward. Um, and the issue that I think is going to be the, the big driver for me uh, next year, the years in the year subsequent is who in Alaska is going to pay. There's a there's a big battle going on. Uh, um, sort of underneath the surface, uh, where everybody's, you know, using the old, uh, the old uh, 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 Senator Long, Russell Long, quote about "Don't tax me, don't tax you, tax my, or don't tax me, don't tax my friends, tax that guy behind the tree." Uh, there's a big battle going on of of who's going to get taxed, and Natasha. I mean, we've talked about this in the past, but we're going to see it again this coming year. We're seeing it in what she's talking about with 100 billion dollars. Natasha is going to push for that tax to be borne by middle and lower income Alaska families through essentially taxing away the PFD, um, uh, cutting the PFD, but it's essentially a tax on the PFD. Others, um, uh, the article, uh, James Brooks's article mentions Cliff Grow talking about a progressive income tax. Some people are going to try to push that burden off on uh, the top 20 percent or the top 40 percent, the same people who pay uh, federal income taxes. Uh, and and push it in that fashion. Some people are going to try to push it through a sales tax, uh, which which again is a regressive tax. The largest burden falls on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families uh, through a sales tax. Even if you have exemptions uh, for groceries and and, farm, and 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 meds and other things, uh, that burden still falls heaviest on middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, and some people are going to try to push it that way. The the bi the big battle. Um, uh, this coming this coming year, uh, and in, and in subsequent years is going to be who pays, and 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 I think uh, it's important uh, for for those who are really interested and really interested in the Alaska economy uh, and on equity for Alaska families to focus on who pays. PFD cuts, um, and we've talked about this in the past. PFD cuts not only have the largest adverse impact. On middle and lower income Alaska families, they also have the largest adverse by taking money out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families. They also have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Um, and I think I think we need to have a, a laser like focus as we go through these battles now uh, in the coming years uh, about about who's getting the burden. And as we've said in the past, I think it's I think that's important not only from the standpoint of equity. Not only from the standpoint of the overall Alaska economy, but important from the standpoint of creating the incentives to keep spending down. If the top 20% don't have to pay, they don't care about how much is being spent. They shove it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. So spreading that burden, spreading the burden of who pays is not only important from the standpoint of equity, not only in the standpoint from the impact on the Alaska economy, but important from the standpoint of creating the incentives to, uh, to keep spending down. If the top 20 percent have to have to have to pay that class, the donor class will be as engaged in keeping spending down yeah. uh, as, as anybody else. You know, Brad, as we see this, you know, I think this is what Hammond talked about this. He warned when they uh, eliminated the uh, 
income tax in the state. In fact, he had recommended just zeroing out the percentage and then having it on the books because he understood that people having skin in the game was the only way to really control the growth of government. And we've seen how prog- you know how how prescient that was. Um, over the last uh, you know 25 or 30 years as we've seen state government just kind of explode in its spending with a complete and total disconnect from the people and only now are people really feeling it with these takings of the permanent funds and everything else but now the politicians got their hooks in it they really have no interest in getting the people's money back to them instead it's about protecting their own this goes back to kind of that disconnect that you talked about and that we talked about in the last break with Natasha just not understanding you know what the average alaskan is really feeling right now yeah, exactly right michael i mean she does she doesn't have to bear the burden i mean P- the pfd is peanuts to her uh, and her family and she doesn't have to bear the burden and economically they're sort of disconnected from the from the hardships that alaska families uh Alaska families are fake, facing and using pfd cuts means she's disconnected from from having to pay for uh, uh, the cost of government. I don't want an income tax. I mean, I'm, I'm going to pay a fair amount, uh, under an income tax and, 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 and you are, and others are, I don't want an income tax, but we have to find it. Somebody's going to pay. I mean, gov- we, this election has, has demonstrated and this governor's budget has demonstrated that we're not going back just to traditional revenues. Somebody's going to pay. And so as we think about who pays, what structure we use to use who pays, we need to think about one that's going to create incentives to get spending down. And and having having a using a tax I mean, this is this is the argument that some people have against progressive income taxes. And I agree with if you use a progressive income tax, only the top forty percent pay, the bottom sixty percent don't pay, and so they continue pushing for more and more and more government uh, because they don't have to pay. I agree with that. You have to create a, a structure that has an incentive for them to want to bring spending down. But you also have to have that incentive on the top 20 percent to bring spending down, because, frankly, they're the ones they're the ones in control of the legislature. They're the ones that's the donor class. They're the ones that have the most influence with with legislators. You want them to pay so they have an incentive to bring to bring spending down. If somebody's going to have to pay, everybody ought to have to pay. Everybody ought to have the same incentive to bring it down. So right. that's I, I don't want to pay a tax. Um, I agree with 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 no doubt. You know the twenty thousand people in the chat room right now saying they don't want to pay a tax. I agree with that. But to but to minimize the tax we're going to have to pay, there is going to be a tax to minimize that tax. We need to have everybody engaged. Everybody needs to have skin in the game. Everybody needs to feel. Uh, the impact of it. As long as Natasha doesn't, she won't care about it. Right. Well, and James says, our liberty and the and the erosion thereof is Alaska's skin in the game. That's why Alaskans want a liberty-based solution. But the problem is, James wants that. I want that. Probably you, Brad, want that. The problem is, is that Natasha and company and many of those who are in the legislature, those top 20 percentile income earners, they're not looking at it through a liberty based lens. They're looking at it as what affects my bottom line most, what affects my constituents bottom line most. They're not thinking about whether or not it makes it more free or less free. They're thinking about what does it cost me? And so while we might be fighting over liberty based solutions out here, the problem is they're the ones that have got their hands on the tiller and they are thinking about it strictly from a monetary aspect of how does it affect them. And if they can avoid the pain, they will, as shown by past performance. Yeah, exactly right. There there aren't I mean, th- this governor's budget as as much as anything else, this is this is essentially his last budget before before he goes into reelection mode. This governor's budget showed that he's not willing, he's not willing to make the effort to get spending down. Um, there's not 21 and 11 in the legislature that are otherwise going to, that are otherwise going to drive uh, uh, spending down. The governor probably had 16 that would have backed him up on, on making vetoes, but if he's not going to make the vetoes, and this budget showed he's not, that 16 is sort of a wasted asset. We don't have, there's not, there's not the players in the government to, to make these cuts. Absent that, uh, we need to incentivize everybody to reduce spending as, as much as we possibly can uh, and and use continuing to allow Natasha and others to use PFD cuts, which they will if they're if they're not otherwise, you know, 
directed, allowing them to continue to use PFD cuts to fund government uh, is not going to create an incentive to keep spending down. It will among you and me and others, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in the chat room, but it's not going to create that incentive in the top 20% that's in control of the legislature uh, and uh, and in control of the donor class. Um, an advisory vote uh, is is in the works. I know Dunleavy has worked towards that, but that's no guarantee, of course, that the legislature will do what they're told. Uh, final thoughts on that, Brad, before I let you go. We're not going to have an advisory vote. I mean, you, you don't think it's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, there's not going to be 21, 11 to, to vote for an advisory vote. That was that was a dead on arrival uh, proposal. This we're, we're we're getting down to we're getting down to we are going to have uh, uh, additional uh, 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 taxes. It's just a question of who those taxes fall on. All right. Well, on that cheery note, Happy New Year. <laughs> Brad, um, as always, I mean, it's a dose of common sense. It's a dose of reality. And I know people don't want to hear it, but that's just kind of how the ball bounces. Thank you for coming on board, my friend. I hope you have a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Enjoy some quiet time, a little unplugged time. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again in the new year. Michael, thank you. Uh, uh, happy, Merry Christmas to uh, and Happy Holidays to you, Terry, uh, and the family. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We are taking our annual holiday break next week, and so look forward to you joining us again on the weekly top three in two weeks' time after the